سو وراكم ورجعوا من ده عباد ذلكم الله ربكم فتبارك الله رب العالمين هو الحي لا اله الا هو فادوه مولسين له الدين الحمد لله رب العالمين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون وسلام على المسلمين والحمد لله رب العالمين. Thank you very much, Imam Jala. Bishop Adiko, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Chairman. Gracious and eternal Father, we continue to thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and for your love for all your creation throughout the whole world, particularly for those whom you have created and planted in this nation, the Gambia. We continue to bring before you the sittings of the TRRC, and we continue to bring all those witnesses who will be testifying before you. We pray that by Holy Spirit's power, you will grant them the grace to be bold enough to come here and speak the truth and that for the commissioners, you will give us the design meant to be able to design from truth and falsehood. And we do ask that, Lord, you will continue the healing process. You will continue the reconciliation process. And the Lord, that reparation will be made and justice will also be served for all. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, um, uh, Bishop Odeko. Council, are we ready with um, today's witness? Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning, all. Yes, we are indeed ready to proceed. The witness is waiting in the waiting room. Um, uh, Ms. Maria Masingate would lead this witness. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, you may bring in the witness. I am in Kali. Do swear that. Do swear that. I'll speak the truth. I'll speak the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning to the audience and good morning, Mr. Witness. As you know, my name is Maria Masingate and I will be questioning you on behalf of the Commission today. There are a few issues that I would like to deal with today with you. And um, one of the issues is your background. I'll ask you questions as to your background just to establish who you are. Then we move briefly into July 1994, 22nd July 1994, and then we'll deal with November 11, the issue of Fafanyang and how he was killed. And then finally, we'll give you the opportunity to speak your mind to the nation. Do you understand? Just a few basic rules. The simultaneous interpretation going on as we speak, so I'll advise that you speak into the mic and you speak slowly so that the interpreters will be able to interpret whatever we're saying. Can you please tell us your name? Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Council. I am Lamin Koli. I'm born in, on the 24th November 1961 in Dimbaya village. What is your current rank? My current rank is warrant officer class 2. 
When were you born? I was born on the 24th November 1961. Where did you attain your primary and secondary education? Can you please specify with dates? Um, I attended Busura Primary School. Um, dates as to the day itself might be, might be difficult. I've forgotten, but I attended Busura Primary School in 1967. How about your secondary education? Secondary school, I ended up a secondary school in 1974-75 academic year. And by 1979, I graduated. What did you do after your graduation? After when I graduated, I joined the WEC mission, WEC mission, Worldwide Evangelical Crusade mission in Sibano, where as an auxiliary nurse. When was that? It was in 1980 to 82. Between that. After work, what did you do? After work, I joined MRC, Medical Research Council, as a data collector. How long did you work with MRC? For MRC, I worked with MRC for at least three years. After MRC, what did you do? After MRC, I decided to join the Gambia Armed Forces, Gambia National Army, in January 1991. What motivated you to join the army? Um, the most thing that motivated me to join the army is I see I'm a, I'm a Gambian, and to my own health, to my own mind, nobody else shall come from another country to de to defend the integrity of uh, 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 the people, my people as Gambians and the integrity of my nation. What intake were you when you joined the army? I was intake number 15. Can you recall the names of some of your batchmates? Yes. Um, Lieutenant Edward Singate was my squad mate. Lieutenant Peter Singate was my squad, squad mate. Colonel um, So Modu is it Modu So Colonel So was my squad mate, and presently serving Colonel Hina Sambu is my was my classmate. JCB Mendy was my squad mate. When you joined the army, how long did your training last? Our training lasts for four months, from January to April, we graduate. Can you please give us a brief detail as to the training you received? We, I was trained, we were trained on basic military, like field craft, map reading and, uh, and mi basic military training as in, uh, in, as, uh, in general. How about trainings on weapons? Yes, we did weapon training. Can you please tell us a little bit about that? Yes, we, they, we did weapon training, but basically our weapon training was based on AK-47 and, AK and uh, LMG light machine gun. And we did little training on pistol firing. After finishing your training, what rank were you? I was recruited into the, uh, into the armed forces as a private soldier. Where were you posted? I was posted to Yundum Barracks. As what? I was posted to Yundum Barracks as a medic. Sorry, can you please repeat it? I was posted to Yundum Barracks, a private soldier, but I, as a, I was posted there as a medic. Why were you posted there as a medic? 
because they are then they have seen the my nurse, my nursing certificate that uh, auxiliary nurses training certificate that I had from the work mission. So this is part of the documents that I presented during my selection. So this was this. I think this is what deemed necessary to post me to the um, to the medic. And also, during the training, the medical personnel who was at the training school then in Farafenye, who was late Bojang, last couple Bojang, he's late. Then maybe his service, because he was I learned he was trained on the job, not at a military at a, at a medical institute outside. So I was being re requested from the recruits, from my colleague recruits, to be assisting him on medical, on taking care of the outpatients and the inpatient, outpatients at the clinic then. After that, after when the consultation is finished, I'm, I'm taken back to my colleagues to continue the tra our recruit training. Under whose command were you when you were attached to the medic unit? I was under the command of the Major, Dr. Major Malik Njai, Pacha, nickname. And what barracks was that? Yundum Barracks. How many of you were in the medic unit at that time? Well, I can't remember the actual figure, but we were about 15 to 20. Can you please tell us how you operated? At the clinic. Yes. yes, I was there as a bedside nurse and also overseeing the uh, inpatients and outpatients. When I mean inpatients are patients that are admitted, and when I mean outpatients are patients that come in to pass through to compl give their medical compl health complaints and they are given medications and they go. And also, I was given the, the opportunity to be responsible of the medical store working out the catering and the storing of the medical drugs that are for the army then. Apart from the medic unit, did you have any other work outside of the clinic? No, ma. What was the relationship between your unit and other units in the camp? Yes, because the medical unit is a unit that the infantry cannot go with go without. So in any activity the infantry is doing, the medical unit have to be alongside with them and we work closely. In any of their operations, we work closer with them. Apart from the Union barracks, were you posted at any other barracks? Yes, ma. Please tell us. I was posted to Kudam. I have experience po being posted to Basse, I experience being posted to Katong <coughs> and the former state guard, Fajara Barracks, and now I am at the Navy Clinic. Can you please tell us when you were posted to these various barracks? And please, I'll need the time frame uh, like around 93, 94. Um, remembering the dates exactly would be my problem. When were you posted to Katong? Around what time? Can you recall? Katong, yes, I was posted to Katong immediately when I graduated from the, uh, from the, from the, uh, from the uh, training school, attached to the medic. Then I worked only for three months in Yundum. And then, sorry, I think it will be around three to eight months I worked in Yundum and then later sent to Katong since 1992 and until 1993 I was brought back. Where were you around 22nd July 1994? 22nd July 1994 I was a resident in Yundum barracks and posted to Yundum clinic. Can you tell us about that day at the camp? Well, for the 22nd July day itself, yes, because it coincided on the 21st was a, that was supposed to be a guard of honor of which the former President Jawara was coming from back from his Yamuskoro summit. 
that was on the 21st, and I was part of the group, the medical personnel who covered that uh, guard of honor. I was in the ambulance crew, medical crew in the ambulance. What I can see at the airport there was, I saw some officers who had been searched for the purpose of searching them at the airport. I could not know. Which officers are you referring to? I saw Yaya Jame being searched yeah, as the military police commander then. I saw him being searched at the airport, but he was only one who was in possession with a pistol. I think that was for his uh, operational purpose. What else did you see? And uh, from there, the guard of honor went on well. After that, we all moved back to barracks. And the following day, on the 22nd, I came in, I saw soldiers moving out. Then, and I, because when the infantry are moving out, we, sometimes when they don't request a medical personnel, because it has to be in a written form, they don't request a medical personnel. Normally, we don't attach a medical personnel to them. At what time of the day was that? This was around the first hours of the day from 7, 8 towards 9 o'clock. Then what happened? Then they left. We went back to our clinic and we continued working. Till later we had that I said, we'll treat take over. Can you please tell us what the atmosphere was like on that particular day? Um, it was somehow I can't even explain more because it was then somehow mixed up because some people were confused because we don't know. Because it was something, a news that has just come to us that early morning that we, come, we I, I personally could say I, and I know of that early morning. What did you mean by people were confused? Because I saw people going out, and I, when I heard that, I said, when we heard that, I said, military take over. I was, for me, personally, I was very surprised because I don't know what a military takeover was, neither to know that it was to happen in the Gambia, in the Gambia till I come to hear that it is a military takeover. Did you do anything that day? As to be at the medical site waiting for anything. That, that, that maybe will be needed medically, in the medical. Now, after July 1994, after 22nd July 1994, did anything change in the camp? After 22nd July 1994, well, I can see not, no more changes. Only I was been hearing about arresting of senior officers and other soldiers picking them, but for what reason, I don't know. Who was the commander of Union Barracks before 94? Before 94, there were a lot of a series of commanders that come in and out, because I can remember Maba Job was also once one of the, one of the commanders before, he was the commander before, well, before 94. About after 94? After 94, Mabajob was sent as an uh, outside, and then I think, so Ma, I can't remember exactly who was the commander then. Can you please tell us what was the morale of the soldiers like at the camp in Yundum just after 1994 coup? After 94 coup, the morale we are still normal because we, as soldiers, no matter what situation would, will arise, we soldiers try to maintain morals high because they don't want to show low morals. Can you please explain what you mean by that? Okay. The, what I'm, I'm trying to explain here is even as a, as a soldier, even if something that I don't like, uh, but so long it is uttered by my superiors, 
have to take it with good faith and act fair. Why I would not, I am not there not to show I'm not happy with this or I'm not happy with that. So this is what I was trying to explain. Was there something that soldiers didn't like at that time? You mentioned that like soldiers if they see what they don't like. Uh, because there was something, they, as they could say, because there was something that uh, just, just short time after 19, during the 1994, around the 22nd July time. I can say the only thing that I can say was a change was not even something correct because um, going to the uh, butchery, bringing enough meat for soldiers, I don't know, I don't think then the aid was being paid for, but I can see that meat was a lot abundant. Sometimes I even involved in cancer in condemning some of the milk that the meat that have stayed 48, 24 to 48 hours without being refrigerating it. I was part of people who was trying, who was stopping those, or uh, advising them to dump that meat. And and if there is meat, fresh meat, they can bring fresh meat for the soldiers. Are you saying that they were wasting resources or that they were not preserving food correctly? Well, they were wasting so resources and also um, not preserving food re correctly because there was no resource, uh, resources out of pre preserving food. Apart from that, were there other issues as well? Well, not to my knowledge. Let's move on to November 1994. Who was the commander of the Indian barracks at that time? The, uh, the CEO of Yundum Barracks in 1994, uh, November 1994, I think if I am not forgetting, it may be one, is it Fofana or Baro or something like that? But I can't remember exactly because our relation with the infantry is only when on operational areas. Do you know if any thing unusual occurred at the camp just around 10th of November 1994? Yes, ma'am. Please tell us. Okay, and uh, on a November, 10th November 1994, at around noon, going towards in the evening, I saw council members coming into the, into the, into the camp and they called for a, a, a briefing and a meeting sort of. And in this meeting were many soldiers and I'm sure with some officers. When you say council members, who are you referring to? I'm referring to Lieutenant Edward Singate, Lieutenant Sana Sabali, Lieutenant Sadibo Haidara, Lieutenant Peter Singate, as I can remember, these are the people I can remember fully. Do you know Lieutenant Yankuba Ture at that time? Yes, I know Lieutenant Yankuba Ture at that time. Was he also present at that meeting? Well, this is why I can't remember fully, but he might, maybe he was, he was in there, but I can't remember about him there. Can you tell us what the meeting was about? All I can remember from the meeting ma, is I had nearly pe all the people who spoke there, I had them say, if any soldier want to misbehave or otherwise, would pay a higher price. Can you recall who spoke? Almost all the three men, uh, almost, almost all the three spoke. I cannot remember Peter Singate speaking, but I can confirm Edward Singate speaking, Lieutenant Edward Singate, Lieutenant Sana Sabali, and Lieutenant Sadibu Haidara. I can remember hearing them say, utter those words. 
When those words were uttered, can you recall the atmosphere in the room, in that particular gathering? Well, what I can observe there is many of the soldiers there at the gathering were not happy because um, we cannot just understand because their talk seemed to be parables because we don't understand what they say, what they, were, what they really mean about that because somebody came from the state house come and meet you in your yard and say if anybody that want to misbehave or behave or otherwise will pay a high price can you recall where that meeting was held very well that meeting was held inside yundum barracks very close to the clinic was it in a room or in an open space it was in an open space can you recall how many soldiers were gathered on that particular day? Definitely, Ma. It would be difficult for me to give an actual figure. You were present at that meeting? I was sitting at the clinic gate, which is closer to the gathering. Can you recall if there were men or officers at that meeting? apart from the council members? Apart from the council members, the people I can see most are men. Uh, because I cannot remember seeing. I know because the, when the, the meeting, I heard them say some officers must, must be there. And after the meeting, I heard from my colleagues, there were officers but I cannot say for certain, remember which of the officers are these because it's been a long, a, long, a long while now. Was there a prior notice for that meeting, do you know? Not to my knowledge. Was it normal to have such meetings after the coup? Was it normal? That's wrong. Was it like in normal course of the military affairs to have such? Um, Ma, it is normal, but if it is, before we call it, take it to be normal, it, the, there used to be a notification before, prior to the meetings. And the, we don't call them meetings, we call them parades. If they want to call, talk to, if they want to, to speak to a group of soldiers, we parade, the, we, we go on parade where we are brief exactly as to what will happen and when would it, ha would it happen. But in that, in that manner, I cannot see that as correct. I can only say it's wrong. Apart from what was said, was there anything said at that meeting that struck out? Well, that's the words that I can remember hearing at that gathering. Only Later on in the day, something else happened. I'm talking about during the course of the meeting. Yeah. Was anything done or said by anyone that you remembered, apart from the phrase that you mentioned? Okay. Um, after the meeting, after the, uh, other than that, I can, there was nothing or, or anything that I can remember being said. But one thing, one action that I can still remember is, at the end of the briefing, Lieutenant Edward Singate removed his pistol from the, its pistol, its host, and then fired a shot in the air. Where were you at that time? I was right at the clinic door, sitting. How far is the clinic door from where the meeting was held? It's, it's less than 30 meters. And the gathering even came more closer to, uh, to the clinic gate, and we could hear them clearly. Can you recall the time of the day that meeting was holding? That was, that's, I think it was around noon towards evening. The specific time, I can't remember. Can you recall why Edward fired shots in the air, like he said? Well, maybe. Because this is a probability in my own thinking. 
on my own understanding. Maybe he's trying to show, to show the example of what they are ready to do in seeing everybody who, who, who want to misbehave or otherwise would pay a higher price. So I was seeing that fire, pistol shot firing as a warning. Did any of the soldiers or men that were present, did they speak apart from the council members that you mentioned? I can't remember that. I only heard those council members speaking. Now, how long did the meeting last? The meeting lasted uh, about 45 to one hour, 45 minutes to one hour. But mostly they were all re 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 going around the same words. Did anything happen after the meeting? Yes, ma. Can you please tell us? At around 2200 hours p.m. towards 2300 hours, then I went where I was in my room. I had some gunshots coming from the direction of the main yard. And then as a medic residing in the camp, and I'm hearing shots, multiple shots from the main yard direction, I said, let me step out of my room, my house, to go and see what was going on. From where you were, at what directions did you hear the shots coming from? Yeah. In the main camp, in the main yard and the, and the residence, the residence is at the westward, is on the western side of the, of, the, of the camp, and the camp was at the eastern part of the, of the, uh, 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 the residence. So I was in the residence, which was in the western part of the camp. Can you tell us about the shots? How were they coming in? I was uh, hearing some shots were coming in bust, somewhere in single. What happened? So I decided to come out to step out of my house to go and see what, as to what was going on in the main yard. While I approached the entrance of the main yard, I met one soldier who was on sentries and he was a, a squad mate too by, with the, by the name Keba Jadama. He's late. He denied, at first he denied me entering, but after some minutes of trying to convince him, later on he let me in. Were you the only one that was residing in the camp at that time? No, we were many soldiers, and together with some Nigerians. Were you the only one that decided to go check and see what was happening? When I left my house, my, neighbor, my next door neighborhood who happened to be Corporal Jallo, also came out from his room and we went together. You mentioned that the Nigerians were also staying there. Did they also come out to see what was happening? Not to my notice. Were they present at the camp at that time? No, ma. So what happened? Um, as, uh, after when uh, this Kebajadama allowed me in, I continued. Then I met up with Lieutenant Edward Singate and Lieutenant Sadibu Haidara. When we met up with Lieutenant Sadibu Edward Singate and Haidara, Lieutenant Edward Singate told me that he called me class because we are squad mates. He said, class, I said, yes, sir, what, what's going on, sir? He said, there are some soldiers who want to counter the coup. That's, that's the July 22nd military takeover coup. But there will be a massive crackdown on those involved. These are the words that Edward spoke, told, told me. Where was this exactly, from the point where you got in from the sentry where was it i got when i got out when i come in from the sentry from the at the back gate i came i met singate 
when I come beyond the ante room, going towards the guard room, I met up in that area. That is the street where the part where I should have turned right to go to the clinic. And I met up with uh, Edward, Lieutenant Edward Singate and Haidara at that point. What did you understand by what he said to you at that time? Yes, I related it to their afternoon meeting, saying anybody who want to, uh, be, to misbehave or otherwise. So after when he told me that there are some people who want to counter this, I straight away related it and said, oh, that must be the case. This is why these people, do, that's why they, are, they were here last afternoon and then talking in that manner. Can you describe the atmosphere? Very terrible. Please explain. Um, because it was very chaotic. What do you mean by chaotic? Because... People were not speaking. I, for me, were, if it was not Edward who explained to me directly, I may not understand. But I see people going up and down. Soldiers going down there, running there, coming in, going out. What were they running towards? What were they doing? Some were picking their arms because we are, it is almost, it is almost, we are almost entered the night. So somewhere I went to pick their arms because of the, I'm so, why they're picking their arms is because of this information that has come, that Edward has told me. At that time, were shots still being fired? Did you hear shots? No, then shots were reduced down. No, no, not, no shots were coming in. Apart from Edward, did you speak to anyone else? Yes, ma. Please tell us. Um, when, after my talk with uh, Edward Singate, uh, Lieutenant Sadibo Haidara cautioned me, telling me that why are you here at this time of the night? I replied to him, Sir, as a soldier and a medical officer, a medical personnel residing in the camp, I think it is my responsibility to come and see as to what is going on so that if anybody needs medical attention, everyone that needs medical attention would be attended to. This is why I am here at this time of the night. Were you on duty that particular day? That particular day, around that, the, the, around those days, the, that first month, there was nothing like a roster being published. It was a sort of, a standby sort of, because there were people whom, you know, they are very terrible. If they come and you are, they need you, you are not seen, <laughs> you are there to explain. And these are people, when I say people who are very terrible, I can mention some names. And this is Lieutenant Sana Sabali. It was just like a bush wildfire. Tell us what you mean by that. He was just like wildfire. What I mean by wildfire is, we scared of him. I personally was scared of him, and I'm so there are a lot of soldiers who were scared, scared of him. Because anything this man, what this man say, have to be. If not, you pay a high price. Can you please give us an example of that? Like, if he said, even if he, if he, if he, if he said this, and you try to deny or to show or to, or to delay, there is most likely that you will be you will be a victim. He might fire you, or he, he, he fire you dead, or he, he, he give cause serious body, bodily harms on you. Was there or any, take you to mile two? Sorry, was there any incident of that sort? Did you witness or hear about any incident of that? Yes, I didn't witness, but I hear stories of such. Can you tell us about it? Because. And not only stories of such, because I've seen some victims who are of that such, because not only on the 11th day itself, but in the, that early, that, uh, in that night itself. But as the day goes on to, towards the following morning, it was terrible. Because I had some soldiers who were carried and, and some soldiers were killed at Fajara Barracks. Um, so we'll get to that, but for now I will just want to deal with the situation at that time.
Thank so you. let's just come back to where we are. So at that point, he said, you were afraid of Sana and what he will do, mm. and that you, all soldiers at that time were on standby. That's where, why you were at the camp that day. Yes, so sir. when you spoke to Sadibo, what did you do? And after speaking to Sadibo, then they told me that after the, our conversation with them, they told me that they are moving towards fa to Fajara, they are moving to Fajara Barracks. Then I retired from where we were standing and I retired back to the clinic. Who told you they were moving to Fajara Barracks? Edward, uh, Lieutenant Edward Singate. Did he tell you why they were moving to Fajara Barracks? No. Did but you at that time know why they were moving to Fajara Barracks? Um, I may speculate because what he told me was there are people who want to, uh, who want to counter and they will pay a higher price. They, there will be a massive crack, crackdown on them. So I am so that was that, that, that's why he, they took off for Fajara Barracks. Did you eventually find out why those shots were being fired on that particular time that you mentioned? No, I didn't make a, a follow-up to find out because it was not my responsibility. But I came to hear that when they were coming in, I think they were using those shots as to strategize to, to, to frighten the, the like a strategy to f strengthen, to frighten the sentry, the sentries at then, and then being able to be, being able to penetrate and enter the, the camp. But to my notice, there was nothing as to my notice that there is any casualty or anybody injured. So I suspect those shots might be in the air to confuse the sentries so that they can have a way in. Apart from Edward and Sadibu, did you see any other council member that night? Yes, Sana Sabali, Lieutenant Sana Sabali, I saw him. Because I, while I was this talking with uh, Lieutenant Edward Singate and Lieutenant uh, Sadibu Haidara, Sana was not more than 10 meters away from us. He was standing by a vehicle that was about to move. Can you tell us in what state Sana was at that time? Very furious. Can you please describe it? Because if you look at Sana's face, you will never believe that it is the same Sana that I know. What was he doing? And then he was just standing waiting for uh, for Edu to be ready, speaking with, with, with me, and they go. This is what even hastened that even uh, I was wanting to ask some questions, but I couldn't do so because he was in a haste, and he was even at the time hastening Lieutenant Edward Singate and Lieutenant Sadibu Haidara to move. At that particular time that you saw Edward, Sana, and Sadibu, did you see anyone else around them, like their orderlies? Well, I cannot remember fully whether there were, but I'm sure for those people, anywhere they move, they are always with their, they are always with their, with their, with their orderlies. And sometimes they can, they can come into the camp. Their orderlies sometimes don't follow them foot to foot when they are in the camp, but they always, sometimes they will leave them in their vehicles. Maybe one will, uh, will be with them. Or sometimes when they know that, when they are not that in a haste, they can just move alone. You said Sana was standing by a truck. What kind a of a vehicle? A vehicle. What kind of vehicle was it? Sorry, I think it was a Pajero or a, an, a Land Rover. I can't remember fully, but this was a military vehicle. Were there other vehicles around that end too? Yes, and uh, there was other ve other vehicles because uh, Lieutenant. Edward Singate came with a vehicle from then from the state house. He came with a vehicle. They all, all of them came with vehicles. How many vehicles? I can't remember exactly how many vehicles because the vehicles I saw standing around that because from the clinic you can see a little bit far distant, very clear. So what I can see, I can remember seeing up to three to four vehicles that were standing. 
apart from the vehicles? Was anything ob like obvious around the vehicles? No, some of the vehicles that they came with were tinted glasses. So after speaking to Sadibu, you said you I left. Re I retired back to the clinic. What did you do afterwards? Because in the night I went back in the clinic and keep waiting in the, and keep staying in the clinic. There I was at daybreak, by daybreak being the eleventh day of November. You said you stayed at the clinic? Yes, ma'am. Did you spend the night at the clinic? Yes, ma'am. Were you the only one at the clinic at that? Well, I was not the only one at the clinic. Can you tell us who you were with at the clinic at that time? Yeah, I was there with one uh, Ibrahim Anjai. Not the Ibrahim Anjai that, they, that, that was shot. And I was there with one Buntung Bajo who shortly left after the takeover, left the army after the takeover. And I was there with uh, some other men because then the camp, everybody, many people st slept in the camp and uh, so beddings were a problem. So some just come to go sit around and they're chatting, waiting for daybreak. You mentioned earlier on that Edward told you that they were going to Fajara Barracks. Yes, Did they eventually leave for Fajara Barracks? Yes, ma'am. What was the atmosphere like at the camp that night when they left for Fajara Barracks? To me, I can describe it as very confusing because to what I hear from Lieutenant Edward Singate that uh, there are people who want to counter and them leaving. So I don't know. I was in a state of confusion for myself. I'm talking of myself now because it is night. You don't know who is the enemy and where is the enemy expected to come from. So this was the confusion that, I'm, that was happening in the night. That night, since you said you were with other soldiers in the clinic, Yes. Did you come to hear about what happened at the camp that night? For that night in the camp, nothing happened. Only people were only started sitting down, being alert to observe for any, for if, in case there is, if, for any attack that is expected. Because when it says people want to counter, it could be that the camp would be attacked. So we were all in ready, waiting, looking, watching out and observing for any abnormality that would happen in the camp. Was the atmosphere then normal or fearful on that day? It was not normal, it was fearful. Fear of what? Fear of attack. What attack are you referring to? Like the people who want to, who they are, he is talking to, he told me, he was telling me that want to counter may want to attack the camp and then in order to have more support or to, uh, to, or to gain more, more arms and ammunition. This I cannot tell. So this was the fear to me that what was going on. At that time, did you have an idea about the people Edward was referring to? Well, I, heard, I have no idea about those people at that time. You were telling us about daybreak. Can you please tell us what happened? In uh, daybreak? Daybreak. Uh, day, uh, the following day, uh, the, by daybreak, being the 11th day of November 1994, I saw vehicles coming in because at the, at the place where I, I was sitting at the clinic entrance, if you sit there, you can see right at the main gate what is coming in. I saw vehicles coming in with a truck behind them. Can you tell us at that time, what time was it? It was around 9, 09 hours a.m. Please proceed. 09 hours a.m. What happened afterwards? As I saw these vehicles come in, entered, and they passed towards the officer's mess, anteroom, where they, were, where they parked. How many vehicles were they? Um, roughly it was, I can remember, around two to three vehicles and the truck itself. What kind of truck was it? It was a military truck. 
What else? Okay. When that happened, we, they went towards the, uh, the office, the ante room where they parked. So I was still at the clinic. But later, I had a, I had gone shot from that direction. Before we move on to that, I just want to clarify a few things as to that particular, at that time, what you saw coming in. Now, who was in that particular truck or in the vehicles that were coming in? Okay, I didn't actually look into the truck who was in there because I didn't read there till we, till they parked. But to my own view, I know it was the Junta people that were that came in with, with that truck. Did you see them, or you just assumed that it was the Junta? I assumed that it was the Junta. Why did you assume that it was the Junta? Because the way that convoy was coming in, and I was told since in the night that they are going to Fajara, but they will be back, and I haven't seen them. And the vehicles, the small vehicles that I that I saw in the night, were the same vehicle, the small, the same vehicle that came back in the early morning. So I know that I. I, I can speculate that it is the junta that came in back that came back at that time. See any particular person you recognized in those vehicles? Well, at the time they were passing at, at my area, where, from where I was sitting, I couldn't recognize them till when I had a gunshot from where they parked. I was hearing gunshot from where they parked. I again decide to go to go from the clinic towards that uh, officer's mess to see what was again going on can you just to clarify this can you tell us what was the distance between where you were and where you had the gunshot coming from mm -hmm. okay where i was the clinic block and the ante room you have about a block in between because there is the and there you have the communication room, and alongside the same line with the clinic is where you have the commander's office, the CEO's office. That behind the CEO's office you have next to the CEO's office you have the orderly room, and then behind the orderly room you have the ante room, and uh, uh, behind the CEO's office itself you have the communication room. So the distance would be around 15 to 20 something meters. Exactly, I cannot give a, a specific. How long after they arrived did you hear the gunshot? After their arrival, shortly, around 10, 15 to 20 minutes, I had gunshot. How many shots did you hear? I have multiple shots. So what did you do afterwards? I stepped out of the clinic, rushed into the clinic, Pick my weapon and then going towards the, the direction where they are because at, at that time every soldier any if you're moving from place any if you move into anywhere you have your arm with you for your for your safety first before anything. Oh, sorry, were you the only one in the clinic at that time? No, sir ma. Can you recall how many of you were in the clinic at that time? Well, I cannot recall exactly how many people were there at the clinic and also I cannot recall who and who were there because some others came and spent the night there with us. And they were all there in the, at the early morning. So <coughs> you mentioned that you went in and you took a weapon. Yes, my arm. Where did you get that weapon from? That weapon was the weapon that I, I, I grabbed from the, early, from the armory in that night when I, have that, when I had the information of people want to counter. So I, 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 I rushed to the guard room because some other, other people who were without arm all rushed to the guard room, to the armory, simply because just around that time, armory was not controlled, arms and ammunition were not controlled, so it seems we all run to get an arm for our security, for our own safety first, before any other action. Did you sign out the weapon? No, ma. 
What type of weapon was it? AK-47. What did you do after you got the weapon that night? What was the first thing you did? When I picked that, uh, that weapon, all that I can remember is I first cocked it to clear it. Then I attached my magazine and went with it. And then? I went with it that night. I went with it. I sat with it like that in the, in the clinic. Till the early time, the time that I told you that I picked it. That's the time I picked it. Going towards where the shots were coming from. Ma. Was the weapon in your possession throughout that night? Yes, it was in my possession, but I just picked, uh, packed it at one corner in the, in the clinic there, in the, in the store, because I was in charge of the store. I have the key to the store, so there I just put my weapon, but the key is always with my hand. So what did you do when you were walking towards um, the shots that you heard? When I was walking towards the shots that I had, I saw a colleague the incident I still go into deep regret if I am to remember this issue. You need time to no, don't worry, it's all right, I just need water. Are you okay to continue? Yes, ma. Can you proceed from where you stopped? Uh, I saw this gentleman crossing by the name Fafanyang. It was terrible. Please, can you tell us what happened? Yes, I saw this man crossing, and from the direction of where the junta was standing, and the, some soldiers gathering around that direction, I saw this man car crossing from that area going towards the cookhouse. And suddenly I had a gunshot. When I had that gunshot, I saw this, uh, this colleague lying down innocently on the ground. <sighs> and then as a medic, I decided to rush to this guy in order to give him any help that I can render. But all of a sudden, while running to this gentleman, and because the weapon was hanging in my front, it was trying, it, 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 the, the movement of the weapon was too much. And I was trying to control, while trying to control this weapon, I am sure my hand must have touched the trigger, which led to the weapon to fire. When my weapon fired, immediately I saw blood. <laughs> Oozing from the head of this gentleman that I really wanted to help. Totally, I was in a, in a state of panic. And we coincided with a voice that came around the gallery, the same gallery where the shot come from, urging me to get out from that place. Ma, imagine. Somebody I wanted to save happened to be finished by my own mistake, I can call it, because I don't know how it comes. But I'm sure it wouldn't have happened if my hand didn't touch the trigger. And it happened to be the, the, the discharge that completed the colleague that I wanted to help. You can take a few minutes if you want before I ask follow-up questions. 
Mr. Chairman, I think the witness will like a few minutes before we continue. Uh, thank you. Uh, the meeting is suspended for about five minutes. Thank you very much. Kakuma koi soto nyingku oto, isita na website oto, www.qmoney.gm. Wala isen kumandi nyin telephone number alto, 3100218. Wala, yen kumandi nyin number doto, 3333291. Isa email ofa nang kinyan o, newagent at qmoney.gm. Danga kumase business, buga koyo ka, wala danga buga door business. Nasa Heldal, Akiu Mwani, Lena Reglen Sokla, Nekal Taikati Kiu Pawa, Ngiri Nyu Mwuchu Ayip Nyungfa. Akiu Mwani, Dinele La Jangal, Bado Jum, Dinele La Japale, Basa Heldal. Nga Buga Teki, Fena Regja Ijar, Fofu Nuno Sa Kiu Mwani. Nga Jaikati Kiu Pawa Dong, Pur Amsilu La Ler, then you call C31 00218. Walla 33 33 291. Walla the guest to you. See www.qmoney.gm. Walla better able hardy. Gagas to you focus a new agent at qmoney.gm. bundle at QCell, the biggest, fastest, and most reliable mobile operator. We've got you covered with Sunyu Bundle. With Sunyu Bundle, dial star 303 has and get the bundle of your choice. Sunyu Bundle, affordable, fast, and reliable. QCell, we innovate, others follow. QSAL. 4G Mega Data Promo. Now, now with QSAL, the Gambia's leading GSM company, you can get speed based on limited mobile broadband at mercifully reduced prices. QSAL, the first 4G LTE provider, has once again come up with an amazing way for you to access the internet at home, work, or anywhere you may be. Mega, Mega Data, Data Promo. Promo. Grab one of the new QSAL 4G enabled Wi Fi routers and dongles. As low as $1,500 and choose your plan from 1 to 5 Mbps. QSEL's prepaid 4G data plans start at only $1,900. Mega, Mega data, data promo. promo. Available at any QSEL customer. Mr. Kodi, are you good to go now? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, I just want us to go back just to clarify a few details. Now you agree with me that from what you have explained, a bullet from your weapon landed on Fafanya. Am I correct? Yes, ma, exactly. Now let's just go into detail bit by bit as to how the incident occurred. What type of weapon was it? AK-47. I have asked these questions previously. I just want to go over it. Now, when you took the weapon from the armory, did you clear it on the night that is November 10th? On the night of November 10th? On the night of November 10th, yes, I cleared it. How about the morning before you went out? Did you clear your weapon? In the morning before, I, when I pick it before going out to, to, to the, where I had the gunshots. Yes. Truly enough, I didn't even check the weapon, whether it is cleared or not. I just pick it and grab it and continue running, going there. 
Now, in dealing with weapons in the Army, since you mentioned earlier that you did weapons training when you were recruited, yes, what is the standard procedure in handling weapons? Um, in handling a weapon, first, when you take your weapon, you need, you need to clear it and then put it back in safe mode. Why? Because for your own personal safety first. Because if it is not safe, it can discharge or it can discharge at any time when either willfully or mistakenly a hand is put on the trigger and squeezed. Is it at every point that this is done? No, but at any time you took a weapon, normally you should check on your weapon to make it safe. Now, would I be right to say that when you pick up a weapon and you leave it standing for a while, when you come back again, you should ensure that you clear it first before picking it up for anything? Um, yes, ma. Did even, even if you don't clear it, but you should ensure as to whether the way you kept it, you left it, is the same way it is. If it is not yet returned to the guard room, if it is still under, you, you are sti it is still under use by you. You have told us that when you picked up the weapon on the tent, mm -hmm. you cleared it. Yes. Then you put the weapon in the store. Mm -hmm. And the following morning, when you picked up the weapon again, that is the 11th at 9, you did not clear it. You just took up the weapon and you went out with it. Am I correct? Yes, you are correct. In taking the weapon in the night, I cleared it. Then I cocked it and save it and keep it so that in case of what the at in case of attack as what we are pre we, we, we what i speculate because i didn't have of the exact news of what I, the only news i had was there are some people who want to counter so this was the main reason why i cocked my weapon and save it but in the early morning when i was going take it, picking it I didn't take, check it to see whether it is still, the, the click is still at safe or it has moved or what else. I didn't have, I didn't do that. And that, it's my own mistake. I took it. When you heard the noise from outside, what was the atmosphere like? What, what did you feel when you heard the noise from outside? When I heard the noise, I was feeling more scared. And then when I went out, more specifically when I went out and see my colleague hit town, I was in a state of panic, definitely. I was totally disoriented. But I, 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 I tried myself, I was trying myself to put myself together in order to be able to do a little help. You mentioned here earlier on that the environment on the 10th of November 1994 was very fearful. Very chaotic, yes. And you also mentioned that you were a bit tensed yes, after the noise you were heard. Yes, ma'am. Was it normal for you to step out with your weapon in that kind of environment at that time? At 9 a.m.? Yes. That was 9 a.m., 9 daylight. That was daylight. Yes, was it normal? in a fearful and tense environment to grab your weapon and just come out with it? Uh, yes, it is normal. Because if it is at, a, at, a, at an area that the vision is very clear that you can see, as a professional soldier, you can be able to come out from your house and then move towards the area. If you, are knowing, if you know your, move, but your movements, then you will know how to move towards anything, because you will be moving and observing. You mentioned that you saw vehicles coming. Yes, ma. And you mentioned that it must have been the council members that came in. Yes, ma. Now, at that point in time, 
apart from the council members coming into the camp, was there any other tension in the camp at that time? The only tension was everybody was high, waiting to see about the, what would be the outcome when these council members, they told us the, the previous night that they are going to Fajara and we see them coming in a convoy at the following day at 9 a.m. So everybody was, is, uh, was in a state of little confusion of what is the outcome. So this was why most of us were interested to go closer to where they are in order to know what is the outcome. Were you the only one that was around that area and at that point at that time? Around the area you were coming from, were you the only one there at that time no, and at that point? I was not the only one. I just picked my weapon and went out. Maybe subsequently the others also may come following, but I don't notice that. Were you the only one with your weapon around that area at that particular time? Uh, all soldiers who slept in the barracks at that time were with their weapons, but I can say I picked my weapon and come out. Whether they come out, they also followed with their weapons or not, that I don't know. How were you handling your weapon when you got out of the clinic? I was handling my weapon, pointing my, the weapon was pointing to my front. Can you please help demonstrate how you were handling your weapon? Well, I hung my weapon when it, the, it came here the muscle and the muscle was pointing in front of me. Are you right-handed or left-handed? I am right-handed. So where was the muzzle pointing at that time? It was pointing because the way I handled it, it was pointing. It, it, it was not pointing right to my left, far into my left, because I tried to point it, uh, hold it, pointing to the, towards my center, the center of my body, by pressing behind. If when I was going, when I, in that night is what I was doing, I was handling it, but the position may change when I was running towards my colleague who was already gone down. Can you please explain where Fafanyang was lying exactly from where you were coming from and where he was lying down? Well, where Fafanyang was lying, he was lying along the road that come from the officer's mess towards the guard room towards the cookhouse. And Fafanyang was lying very good, uh, little, uh, little distance from the cookhouse building. And when I came out from that small path, that small path, I was about to come out of the path, I saw Fafanyang down. So I rushed, I rushed towards him. I inclined towards my left where he is and then trying to run to that area. Then I was try also trying to control my weapon to avoid in, uh, obstruction while, while running to care, to, 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 to care Fafanyang. Can you tell us at that point where his body was facing and where you were coming from? We just want to understand the environment at that time. His body was, the head was facing the south, uh, the head was facing the cookhouse and his legs were almost behind from the area where he come from. How about your position? And I am coming out almost at the, cent at the center of his body. What was the distance? Distance was about 10 to 15 meters at the point where he was lying from where I saw I had my, gu my gun discharged. That? 10 to 15 meters. 10 to 15 meters? Yes, ma. When you said when you saw him fall down, mm -hmm. and you had a shot, then you saw him fall down, yes, you decided to go run and help. Yes. Now, how were you running and handling your weapon at the same time? Yes, because if I'm running, when I started running, the weapon started obstruct, uh, obstructing me. So my hand, my right hand, is the hand that I was trying to grip my weapon 
from the center of the weapon towards the bot. And this is where exactly the trigger and the magazine were. Towards the center, from the center of the, uh, the weapon towards the, the, the bot, its bot, is where my hand was handling. And this is why I said, I am so my hand must have touched the trigger. At what point did the bullet come out of your weapon? Was it before or after you got to him? Before I got to him. I just want to go into the basics of how the weapon works. You've told us that it was an AK-47 that yes. you moved from the armory. So I just want us to go through the basics of how an AK-47 works so that we can understand the situation. So I just want you to affirm what I'm about to say. So am I correct to say that for that weapon to fire and kill Fafanyang, you must have loaded the magazine on the weapon or there must have been a live round in the chamber. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Am I also correct to say that you must have moved the safety catch to automatic for the weapon to actually fire? Well, it's not only at automatic that the weapon can fire. Because this weapon is a weapon that have double, two clicks. Have a click that is fired semi-automatic. And the second one, the weapon fires automatic. How many shots were fired? One single shot. Correct to say that it was on automatic? It was not automatic. It was at semi-automatic. means it was not on a safety mode exactly and after having a live round in the chamber and the safety being at semi-automatic then that means there must have been a target the weapon was aiming at am i correct there must be if it is and uh, you are like you are aiming at a target yes but if it is that it is a negligent discharge it may be you may be lucky that your the, the bullet will not land on any uh, target it will fly in the air if you are unfortunate that there is something or a, a something or a human being in front of you the weapon, the bullet may land on the, the, on the individual or the target in front of you, even, even whereby you are not aiming it physically, but if naturally the weapon is facing that individual or that, indivi that individual thing, human being or any other thing can be on, the tar on that target. For a weapon to fire, yes. then that means it must have aimed, the muzzle must have being pointed, aimed, pointed po at a particular direction. Am I correct? Yes, ma'am. Then, you must have put your finger on the trigger of the weapon. Am I correct? Yes, ma'am. And then, you must have squeezed the trigger on that particular weapon. Am I correct? Well, even not in the issue of uh, sque squeezing it physically, but if by movement your hand happen to hit on the trigger it can easily squeeze off the the trigger to to allow the weapon to fire but i'm correct to say that your yes. hand must have been on the trigger yes. for that and weapon to fire and it must have squeezed the trigger exactly you are right correct on that and with all of these steps that i've listed in view of all this, would you still maintain the position that, the accident, that it was an accidental discharge? Very well, ma. Let's go through this. One. Yes, ma. Is that 
there must have been a magazine and a live round in the chamber. Yes, ma'am. Two, I... the safety catch must have been moved. Three, your hands must have been on the trigger and your hands must have squeezed the trigger. So all of these must have been in place for that weapon to fire. Am I correct? You are correct, ma'am. And it was your shot that landed on Fafanyang. Am I, am I correct to say that? It was the shot that discharged from my weapon that landed on Fafanyang. Now let's talk about this. From what angle were you when you moved towards Fafanya? Well, as I said, I was coming, the, his, the way he, where he crossed and my coming, if it, is, if, if, if it is to be so a straight line, it would be 90 degrees, estimating the. Mr. Chairman, I believe I have four more minutes. So I'd like to stop here if the commissioners have any for the questions for the witness. Uh, you may continue your four minutes of my questioning, and uh, we may have uh, a few points before we take our break, 30-minute break, from 11.30 to 12. So please continue. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. So we have gone through the basics of how the particular weapon you were using works. And we've already established that in order for that weapon to fire, all these stages must have occurred, that one could not occur without the other. So do you agree with me on that point? Yes, ma'am. Now, can you tell me, when that, your weapon was fired, where did it land on Fafanya? It la I can see it land on Fafanyang's jaw. land around this part of his body because he was lying down face where he lie down he lay down oh, so innocently because he's lying down flat on his belly and chest but the head was tilted his face his face exactly was facing the east the, the east was it the left or the right jaw it was the left jaw And what happened afterwards? I saw blood immediately flowing out of Fafa Yang's face. What can you observe from his body at that point, apart from the blood flowing from his face? Well, what I can observe from his body is I can see blood of the uh, blood that was oozing from his face and also I know whether, whether due to the first shot I saw blood coming out for on the, the ground where he lie down where he, he, he lie down flat on his belly I can see blood oozing out but I was also cautioned because I had somebody shouted a voice, moved from there, and this made me feel more bad than remorsely. I was feeling very bad, and I, I have, the only thing I have to do is how long. My intention failed, and still somebody else ordered me to get out of that area, that place. I have double, double things that still, since after that event up till to date, Ma, I have a lot of I have undergo, undergoing sequence of troubles personally because I couldn't sleep thinking of my colleague and thinking of why was I denied to help him despite my own round has landed on him but why was I denied what would you say to the suggestion that you ins because we've had testimonies from previous witnesses saying that you intentionally shot at Fafanya. I will not, what do you say about that? I will not agree to that. My clear intention is I, I don't kill Fafanya intentionally. 
I was only intending to save Fafanyang's life. But Allah has destined it to be the end of Fafanyang through me, with all my consent. And I agree. Mr. Chairman, I think this is the right time to take a break. Uh, thank you very much, Council. Uh, I wonder if I can ask a very quick clarification from you, Warrant Officer Coley. Sir? One of your, uh, I mean, early on in, the, in your testimony, you mentioned, I'll quote you directly, that the Amri was not under control. The weapons were not under control. How long did that go, and what were the consequences of uh, Amri and weapons not being under control? And was this a night of the 10th or morning of the 11th of November? Sir, this on the night. Uh, on the tent, uh, on, the, on the night of the tent, well, I went to the armory with some. I entered the armory with some other people, but we didn't meet. Some nobody was handling a key to say I will open the armory for you to get the. Oh, it was open, so I can say it was then not controlled. I don't know how long was it, or what. I don't know, but this was what happened. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Kinte. Mr. Colley, sir, um, you earlier told us that uh, you saw a convoy coming into the camp in broad daylight. It was in the morning, though, but at nine, it's broad daylight. And uh, you confirmed that uh, it was the, the junta, the, the, the council members, that were in the convoy. You could not recognize who was in which vehicle, but you recognize the vehicles you saw at night. We are the same vehicles you could identify that morning. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And uh, when they passed to the ante room, you said shortly after you had a gunshot. Sir. And you came out. Now, um, one, the logic is you did not need a gun with you. Two, you were already told that those people who they accuse or suspect of uh, undertaking the coup will be massively cracked down. You should have concluded, it's logical, that the massive crackdown is what is happening. Because these are no enemies, it's not at night, and uh, they, the, gun, the guy they have shot have been shot by the people who said they will do massive crackdown. What sense does it make for you to go and save that life after the guy has been shot by people who said they will make massive crackdown? Your consent could not have told you that you could have been shot to say you are part of it. One, an accidental bullet, a second bullet that may be targeted on the guy could have landed on you. Two, uh, it doesn't make any sense that you are going to save that guy. That, that could not have been the, the logic. That's my argument. Right, sir. Here, the logic is because me, I'm a medical personnel. I'm a medical personnel. And even in, in, in medicine, in taking care of people with the sick and the wounded, even whereby somebody you know, you know that this man is a dying patient, there is still a nursing care for him. There is still a nursing care for even the dying patient. So this was why I still have the ambition to see what help I can render to my colleague who happened to be Fafanyang. Um, le let, me, let me come up again. I'm saying this is not a situation of war. 
where uh, you could uh, you could save someone there are people who are ready to kill the guy and they have started the process and they are around armed and um, with all the stamina and so on to continue until finish so there was no sense going to rescue such a person that's my argument that I think the, my reason is at then if you can remember in my statement I said I was at a state of panic so any action can be taken unnoticeably and un un unconsiderable did you action. also recall that you said Sana was wildfire exactly sir and uh, he would do anything so terrible yes, sir. that could have that consent should have reminded you that the moment you move out for any help you could be the next victim it doesn't sound logical to me yes sir but this was my intention why it happened i cannot even tell so the only thing what i have in mind is it's a destiny allah i think allah something that allah has destined for me to happen because if not I should have had all those senses in me and all that care that I should follow but I am seeing it as an Allah's destiny that I didn't take note of all those possibilities that could happen all that was in my heart is to help a colleague because he was very useful to me when I was undergoing my recruitment Commissioner um, Imam Jalo. Mr. Kuli. Sir. I find your evidence very interesting. You own up the responsibility of killing Papa Nyang. Right, sir. There was a first shot. Did you, did you see the person who shot him? I didn't see the person who shot him. And somebody told you. Move out of there. Sorry. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman. S sorry, Council. I'm really sorry, Commissioner. But uh, these are follow-up questions that I would like to dwell on. So if we can wait until they are addressed, maybe we will throw more light into it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, can We will take the 30-minute break. We come back at 10 past 12. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. New from QSAL 4G mega data promo Now with QSAL The Gambia's leading GSM company You can get speed based unlimited mobile broadband At mercifully reduced prices QSAL, the first 4G LTE provider Has once again come up with an amazing way For you to access the internet at home Work or anywhere you may be Mega, mega data, data promo. promo Grab one of the new QSAL 4G enabled MiFi routers And dongles as low as $1,500 and choose your plan from 1 to 5 Mbps QSEL's prepaid 4G data plans start at only $1,900 Major data, data promo. promo available at any QSEL customer care center for more info call 111 QSEL we innovate orders follow Espace Motors the Gambia's largest auto sales and service